<laughs> oh my. Well, good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know, those of you online who may not know, my name is Lee Epstein, and I am I'm one of the directional leaders here at New Heights Church. And we often say this phrase, it takes the church to be the church. And as Chad has said, twice a year on Family Sunday, we want everyone to know that it, it takes the entire church to raise families. And that means parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, singles, empty nesters, it, it, takes, it takes everybody. Let me, let me give you a quote I think is, is really, really good. It's challenging, yet it's, it's encouraging. It's by Matt Chandler from the Village Church down in, in the Dallas, Texas area. He says, and I quote, if your child's salvation depended on the quality of your parenting efforts, it would not only make parenting overwhelming, but it would make salvation impossible. Can I get an amen to that? Your child will not love God only if you are a good enough parent or run from God if you are in any way found wanting as a mom or dad. Just as in your own life, it is by grace through faith that your kids will be saved. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. He goes on to say what a privilege it is than knowing that God could do as he wishes without us, but that he still invites us flawed moms and dads into how he saves and raises a child to know him. Well, not only is that quote encouraging for those of us who put all the pressure on ourselves to raise godly children, but it also reminds us that God invites not just moms and dads into the process of raising our children, but he also invites the entire community of faith. In the New Testament, a family is often re referred to as a household. But this word is, is layered. In the New Testament, this Greek word is oikos. And when, when we think of a family, we usually think of mom, dad, children. We think of a family unit. But this word oikos is, is much more, as I just said, layered than that. It's generational. It's communal, so it's mom, dad, grandparents, aunts, uncles, neighbors, church members. We desperately need the entire oikos to help raise our families together. I'm, I'm reminded of, I just thought about this this morning, years ago, Ruth and I were watching, do you, do you remember the, the comedian Sinbad? I think he's still around, I don't know. Remember Sinbad? No, super old, Google it if you're under 40, but love Sinbad. And Sinbad said this, I never forgot, he said, when I got in trouble at school, he said, on the way home, because I don't know how, but the whole community knew that I got in trouble at school. So the baker, the butcher, the tailor, the hot dog seller, they all said, Sinbad, do better. Come on, man, we're for you. Come on, don't do that, do this. He said, before I even got home to get it from mom and dad, the community, the oikos came around me and said, you can do better than this. This is what God's people do. Let me just get real personal here. I was a young youth pastor uh, many years ago. And um, I think this happens a lot when you first go into ministry. It kind of came from the business world into ministry. And you don't know how to gauge your hours. And the church can be pretty demanding. And so I was neglecting my wife and my two sons. And not one, but two different men, separate of each other, who didn't even know each other, both believers in the oikos, the community of God, they took me aside and they said, Lee, we appreciate that you love the church and you love God, but you're gonna lose your wife and kids. Stop it, stop it. It's not the church and your youth group, it's your wife, it's God, your wife, and your kids. Let me give you a real practical example of communal discipleship and how we desperately need others to breathe life into our, our children and our children's children. Many of you remember Dave Murray. I want to get his picture up there. He's there in the right corner. Remember Dave and Mel Murray? Uh, one of our, um, th th they were global workers that we sent to India. But before we did that, um, Dave was an intern at New Heights Church. And he took a group of sixth grade boys. You can see him. You see that guy up there in the far left corner? That's Noah, our youth pastor. I know, he was a scrawny looking dude, man. What? Wow. 
little guy. And he took a group of sixth grade boys and he discipled them using the vehicle of guitars. And they called themselves, you ready for it? The Strum Brothers. (laughs) They were the Strum Brothers. And he met with them all year long. He also got Noah started with drums and Corey Granderson, who's playing drums today, um, literally taught Noah how to play drums as well. So for a year, they went through the Word of God, they learned how to play uh, guitars, they formed a band. When that year ended, Noah in sixth grade, he came up to mom and dad and he said, mom and dad, he said, um, he said when, I, when I get to 11th grade, because that's when you could do it, five years down the road, he said, I want to lead my own cell group. And guess what? He did. But then he came to mom and dad and he said this, He said, Dad, he said, you know, for years, I've wanted to be an orthodontal surgeon. I'm like, yeah, I know. We've been praying for that. Yes, (laughs) yes. And he did for years. That was his goal. He had this crazy single-minded goal. And all of a sudden, one day, he comes in and he says, Dad, he said, "Um, I don't want to be an orthodontal surgeon anymore. I want to be a youth pastor. And I said, um, you know, uh, really, you can still be an orthodontal surgeon and help out with the youth. <laughs> and he said, and he said, nope, I'm all in on, on full-time ministry, to which I thought, Good, goodbye, retirement, goodbye. <laughs> Just kidding. R- Ruth and I are forever grateful to Dave Murray. It, it's important to point out the obvious that Dave wasn't his dad, an uncle, or at that time, a family friend. He was a man in the church who loved and followed Jesus and wanted to pour his life into teenage boys so that they too would love and follow Jesus. You've got to hear this. It takes everybody, the oikos, the community of believers to raise our children up. Let me, let me give us an overview of the rest of our service this morning. Brad Ringler, our co-leader of children's ministry, he's gonna come up and talk about what it looks like to, to serve in various family ministries and the importance of, of discipleship in the body of Christ and how that discipleship will leak down into other ministries. Then Charity Stillings, our other co-leader of children's ministry, is going to encourage us to be intentional in family worship. She's going to point out that one size does not fit all, and that with each season of life, it looks different. And then lastly, Noah Epstein from Maui on his honeymoon, wow, more dedication than me, is going to talk about what it looks like to pray for our children. Before we go on, let me just take a minute. I want to honor all of our our newly dedicated um, babies and their moms and dads. I want to get that picture. Oh, my word. If you had your child dedicated yesterday, stand up. Stay standing. Stand up if you're here. Come on. Okay. uh, Yes, you can clap for them. Yes. Yes. Stay stay standing because I want to pray for you, but this is really important. These parents were amazing. They came here yesterday and the heat wasn't on, so it was scorching hot. And imagine this, the technology was not working. Welcome to New Heights, right? So, um, but it didn't matter. God blessed. It was an amazing day yesterday. I was told with, with friends and family included, get this, over 200 people sat right where you're sitting now to dedicate these little ones to the Lord Jesus Christ. How powerful is that? So what I want you to do right now, Chad had us do this earlier, but I want you to stretch your hands out towards these parents. If you feel comfortable and you know them well enough, touch them, lay hands on them, and I'm, I'm going to pray, but you pray silently as I pray out loud. Father, what a privilege it is to come before you today and give thanks for these little ones, and we, we're mindful that life is a gift from you. It doesn't happen by accident, and so we're grateful Um, for this incredible gift. And we ask that you, Father, give these parents courage. They're going to need it. And patience and wisdom and gentleness. Give them, Father, an overwhelming sense of your presence. They need that most of all to help them raise their sons and daughters in ways that honor and glorify you. And Father, we ask 
that these little ones' lives will bring glory to your kingdom. And everything that they do, we're believing that you would be at the forefront. So whatever your plan is for their lives, we trust you. And we believe that you will equip them with everything necessary to glorify you. Our collective prayer this morning, Father, is that their lives would bring the light of Jesus into the, into the world, pointing others to you. And we ask this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Brad, come on up. Good morning, New Heights. Good morning, New Heights. Good morning. Everybody awake out there? All right. Well, I'll go, and I'll address this since it hadn't been addressed yet. Your kids can make noise in here. I'm used to teaching in front of 60 to 70 kids who can't sit still, who make noise, who talk back to me. So if I say something, you want to say something? Come on, bring it. Okay? So like Lee said, my name is Brad Ringler. I am one of the, the children's pastors here at New Heights, and I have a story for you. So it was January of 2016, and my daughter, Caroline, was about, I'm going to try not to cry, um, was about to turn three. She, she's eight now, so it's, it's, she's growing up fast. Um, but she was about to turn three, and my son Nixon was about to turn one. And their birthdays are really close together. And so our, our plan was to just combine their birthday parties. At, that, at their ages, it's really just us inviting our friends over to celebrate that we survived three years of parenting. And so <laughs> we, we were figuring out what to do her for, for her birthday party. And every year, we kind of base it on what she loves the most. So her, her first birthday party was a puppy dog party. She loved dogs more than, more than us most days, it seemed like. And so we did a puppy dog party for her first birthday. For her second birthday, we did a Dr. Seuss party because she loved the book, Oh Say, Can You Say? If you know that one, it's a tongue twister. Uh, and I love to read it. And so she loved to read it. So for her third birthday, we're like, she's old enough. Let's ask her what she wants for her birthday party theme. And without hesitation, she said... Dad, I want a Hogs Sports Radio party. That's a good girl. So, needless to say, we, Nikki and I both, both died laughing because <laughs> that is not what we expected. But it hadn't occurred to me just how much she knew and picked up on how much I love all Razorback sports, anything Razorbacks. I'm, I'm going to read it. I'm going to listen to it. And so when I would pick her up from daycare every day for two years, we, I was listening to Hogs Radio, Bo Mattingly show in the afternoons. And so um, she realized that and that, and she still loves the Razorbacks. Um, but outside of praying for Caroline on a regular basis, the main thing I was giving her was a steady diet of sports talk radio. So Pete Scazzaro, who is a pastor in uh, Queens, New York, says this. He says, you cannot give what you do not possess. And Mick Cullinan, he shared this quote with me a few months ago, and it has stuck with me because it, it is exactly what we're talking about. Scripture says it this way. It says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. We, whether we realize it or not, we are discipling our kids. The question really is, what are we giving them? What are we discipling them into? For three years, I was discipling Caroline into Razorback Sports, which is just setting her up for heartbreak probably. But, <laughs> um, but that's okay. Life is full of heartbreak, right? Um, so are we modeling these things for our kids? Are we modeling the love that we have for Jesus? Do they know that we pray? Do they know we read God's word regularly? How do they see us respond when we get frustrated, upset, overwhelmed? What about apologizing to them? How often do we apologize to our kids when we, when we say something we shouldn't have said? When we make a mistake? Are we modeling gratitude when God is providing for us? And when things seem to be going well, but are we also showing that gratitude when things don't seem to be going well? Because God is good all the time. And don't, and please don't think I'm up here doing all these things perfectly. You can, my wife can tell you, I get too emotionally involved in Razorback games. So, <laughs> but know this, it is never too late to start sharing your time with your kids when you're praying, when you're reading scripture. 
start apologizing to them when you make a mistake. When you show humility, it can go a long way. But if you don't know where to start, the beauty of it is look at the people around you. We are here for you. Come ask Charity and I. What we, Charity and I, we write a lot of curriculum for children's ministry, but we spend so many hours researching and reading and finding resources to better support you guys. We get the pleasure of reading your, or leading your kids for an hour and a half each week. One hour, it's really about an hour and 20 minutes. There's 168 hours in a week. So there's 166 hours there that we don't even see your kids, typically. Wow. And that's, that's the, the role you have. So if you need resources, let us give you some resources. We have some fantastic books in the back that Lee's going to talk about here in a little bit. But let us provide you resources so that you can carry this out well within your home and in your neighborhoods. So as I was preparing for this, I was trying to think of a family that I could highlight. And many came to mind because there's a lot of fantastic families here, but one stood out. So I'd like to introduce you to Greg and Becky Walker. Does somebody whistle? Way to go. Um, Greg and Becky Walker and their three kids, Mia, Gavin, and Kate. And they've been attending New Heights for, they said 16 or 17 years. So they, they've been around for a while. And so I asked them some questions on what this has looked like in their home and why they do what they do. So I see them, they were here this morning, um, setting up the church. They get here before I get here at 7.15 typically, and they're setting up check-in stations. They're setting up signage. They're setting up all these things. And the beauty of it is they have their kids in tow. And so they've been doing this for a long, long time. So I asked them where, how long they've been serving and where all they had served. And this is what they told me. They said, we started serving almost immediately after joining the church. We were part of the teardown team back at Holt Middle School. Then Becky worked in the nursery for three or four years. Then Greg taught Sunday school for three or four years. Then we changed to the setup team, and we've been doing that as a family for about five years. Greg and Gavin come, Greg and Kate come, all five of us together, all kinds of combinations. Well, why the nursery? Because we had young children of our own and wanted, our, wanted to take our turn in serving. Why Sunday school? Because we felt that that it's right to be a part of the spiritual growth of our kids and watch them develop church friendships. And why they do setup team? Because they want to teach sacrificial service to their kids by getting up early with teenagers. I can, as a teen, I would not have been very happy about being here at 7.30 on the weekend. So they're getting up early. They're doing the little things, the things that are unseen often and, and potentially underappreciated. It takes a lot of work to get this place running on a Sunday morning. I asked them what it looks like now that they've been doing it. What changes have they seen in their kids? And they said, the other day, Gavin saw a lady in need and he helped her without prompting. Sorry, guys. He saw, this is the future. Um, He saw something that needed to be done and did it. It was awesome. He's much more sensitive to the needs of the people around him And it's making him a better friend, brother, and son. And we pray that it makes him a better husband and father. So if you're sitting there thinking, man, I've never been discipled. Or I don't feel confident confident enough in my own walk to lead somebody in their walk with Jesus. Or, Or even my parents didn't model this for me. I didn't have a Greg and Becky Walker as parents. I want to encourage you to ask someone. There are many amazing people in here that might be further along in their walk than you are right now. And just asking to to sit with them, for them to just answer questions that you have. In the book, Family Discipleship, which we have, we bought a ton of copies for you guys because Charity and I both read it. It's a fantastic book. Um, The authors, it's Matt Chandler and Adam Griffin. um, And they had this quote that says, don't let your children have the same disadvantage you're attempting to overcome, an undiscipled childhood. Regardless of your past, your future can be one of care, concern, and contrition or humility for the sake of your kids. And I also want to give a shout out to Mick Colinani and Kevin Rusek. There are equipping pastors and they're, they're going to do their spiritual formation class in the fall on Sunday mornings, because I know this is hard for many parents. It's hard. My wife and I've not gone to very many at all, but they're going to do it on a Sunday morning, Sunday school style. We're going to offer an eight week class for parents to basically 
form their spiritual development on a Sunday morning so that we can take care of your kids because babysitters are expensive and our classes don't need to be, they need to have the lowest bar of entry. So Kevin and Mick, so keep an eye out for that for the fall because we want to feed you guys and build you guys up in your, in your walk because it's important, because we know that that will spill into the homes and into your homes and, and the houses around you. Um, Deuteronomy 4.9 says this, only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and their children after them. Guys, don't do this just because it's important. Do it because it's the most important thing you can do as a family, as a family and as a, as a member of a church. Like Noah said, this is, isn't just on the parents. This isn't just on the children's ministry. This isn't just on the volunteers who are back there every single week doing this. This is on all of us. And we want you to all to be involved in this. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. Yay, they are going to talk back to me. Like Brad said, we're used to talking to a crowd that talks to you the whole time you're teaching. So <laughs> you all talk to me as much as you want to. All right, well, I got to share with some of you yesterday at the baby dedication that over the years, my husband Brad and I, um, not married to that Brad, that is sometimes the misconception, right? My husband Brad's in here somewhere. We've had some really solid mentorship from other Christian parents who were a little farther ahead of us on their marriage and discipleship journeys. And for us, that was a game changer. When we look back and count up those years, it's really incredible the amount of influence that those people had over us. And I don't even know if all of them knew the influence that they were having for, over us. Um, so we praise the Lord for a spirit of curiosity, uh, really in both of us. But when I look back, I wanna be honest with myself and say that that spirit of curiosity probably started as a spirit of fear and anxiousness, that I wouldn't measure up to my own expectations to be a wife and a mother, but really it was the Lord and his kindness that he would use even that, even fear and anxiety to teach me to be a better wife and a mother. And so that's how it started for us. That's how we still do it today. We're wise enough to know that we're not wise enough. And so we'll seek people who are, who are a little farther ahead of us, people who we see um, that we're looking up to who are doing a great job. And so that's what we've done for the last, a lot of years. In fact, we have um, a 10 and 13 year old. Uh, and right now we also have the joy of having a toddler. So that's been really fun too. Um, we've seen a lot of change in the way that we have appro approached worship in our home and discipleship of our kids. Um, I think the safest thing to say is that the seasons change, right? Some of you who are ahead of me even, give me a shake. You're, you're like, yes, it changes a lot. So our kids have needed something different in each one of those seasons. And I look around here and I see that there are a lot of families represented here and each one of your families is different. And so what works for my family is not necessarily gonna work for yours, but again, we're all in this together. So there's no one size fits all when it comes to home worship or to family discipleship. And you know, Somewhere along the way, as we were trying to figure it out, I thought that trying was failing because quite frankly, it didn't look the way that I thought it would look. And we certainly hadn't mastered anything. In fact, y'all know with parenting that as soon as you master something, your kids outgrow it and then you are once again left to figure it out, right? That's how every season of parenting looks. So it was a seasoned mama who I was kind of crying to, I would say, that told me that the trying was learning and that our pursuit of God was exactly what our kids needed to see. In fact, we weren't trying to raise Pharisees, right? Who are good at following all the rules. We were trying to raise disciples of Christ who were sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And it would do me good to remember that Jesus has praised the natural curiosity, innocence, and unpolished approach of a child. In fact, we're encouraged to learn to come to him the way that children do. So there's a quote from a Eugene Peterson book on discipleship that I really love, and it says this, and yet I decide every day to set aside what I can do best and attempt to do, to attempt what I do very clumsily, to open myself to the frustrations and failures of loving, daring to believe that failing in love is better than succeeding in pride. Wow. <laughs> and I don't know wow. that there's anything more humbling 
than parenting. So that'll preach, right? Yes. All right. Just, so sometimes discipling our kids is pure delight. And other times it's downright disappointing and everywhere in between. And I don't know about you guys, but generally I shy away from things that make me feel like a failure. I don't sign up for them more than once. But when it comes to family discipleship, we can't not do this. It's our privilege and biblical mandate to disciple our kids. And Psalm 78 says it like this. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. And if you'll join me in this story, remember his mighty wonders are not little things, guys. They were like freedom from slavery, parting of a massive body of water, like food that fell down from heaven, and water from rocks in the desert. I mean, we're talking big things and we need a reminder to tell those stories. So he goes on and he says, for he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. I don't know about you guys, if there's anybody in this room, I don't think, who wants their kids to be stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, or refusing to give their hearts to God, right? But this passage does offer us some guidance on how to worship in our homes, and it says this, tell the stories. Tell the stories from your life and the goodness that God has given you. Look around at what's happening in your community, celebrate those things with your kids, and read the word of God with your children. It is full, brimming with stories of God's faithfulness and his power. There's another quote from that Eugene Peterson book that says this, worship is an act that develops feelings for God, not a feeling for God that's expressed in an act of worship. So we can start discipling and worshiping with our kids in our homes even if it feels kind of weird. If you're like me and you, didn't, you weren't raised like worshiping your, in your home, it, it feels a little weird at first, but our hearts and the hearts of our children will follow. You know, some of this is gonna happen like Brad described um, unintentionally as we go about life, but there's some of it that needs to be intentional and rhythmic. I mean, how deep can a relationship go with a person that you only meet with an hour a week? That doesn't quite add up. In order for our kids to develop a meaningful friendship with Jesus, they need to meet with him several times a week. There's a part of that family discipleship that Brad mentioned has really challenged me, and I'm gonna be completely transparent with you in this. In discipling my kids, I have been challenged by this, and I'll read it to you. It says, family discipleship is the charge to realign your priorities to acknowledge that the spiritual feeding and spiritual covering of your children needs to be as vital to you and your family as our children's physical feeding and physical covering. While bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And the author continues, he says this, clothe your children? Well, yes, of course, every day but also help them put on the full armor of God so that they may be able to stand against the devil's schemes. Feed your kids, yes, every hour of every day, right? Yes, of course, every day, but also give them Jesus, the daily bread of life, so they will not hunger or thirst for eternity. Give them a safe place to live, yes, of course. But teach them to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of their life, that they may inquire of God, and delight in his beauty. Get them an education? Yes, of course, but teach them to discern good from evil and right from wrong. Otherwise, they will choose what seems right and it will lead them to death. If your children are successful and they get everything they ever want, what good is it if in the process they forfeit their eternal soul? So when I read this, 
I was convicted specifically in the area of daily prayer and spiritual protection for my kids. And I had a lot of it, like God was doing a work in me, but I had recently heard a testimony from a good friend of mine about growing up in Malaysia and how aware her mom was of the spiritual darkness around them. You see, Nellie never left the house for school without her mother's prayer of spiritual protection. See, for her mom, there was a sense of urgency because she was so aware of what was going on. And this wasn't just like one more thing on her mom's to-do list to make her a good mom. This was a non-negotiable, like dressing our kids or feeding them before they leave for school. I mean, would you? I wouldn't ever send my kids to school hungry or naked, but I do send them to school a lot of times without a prayer of spiritual protection. So friends, we don't like to think about it, but there's a very real spiritual battle for the hearts and minds of our kids. In fact, the enemy is poised to attack but we don't have to despair because we have a powerful defense. So go ahead, let your mama and papa bear, let it rear up in your spirit and get ready to protect your kids because prayer isn't our last resort. It's our first and most powerful weapon against the enemy. And he would like for you to feel inadequate so that you disengage. And he wants you to be busy so you'll forget. Church family, he wants you to say, well, I don't really do kids or I don't have kids and turn the other way. But if we, as a body of believers, believe what we say we do, it's really time to pray. New Heights Church family, good morning. Um, It's me, Noah Epstein, and uh, please pray for me. I'm on this emergency mission trip situation. Um, It's been rough. No, no, I'm kidding. By the time you watch this, I'm in Maui, Hawaii, on my honeymoon. Um, So please pray for Madeline and I as we embrace the adventure that is marriage. Church, I want to come at you today as an espresso shot of joy, hope, and encouragement. But I also wanna challenge you today. See, 1 John 5, 14 says this. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Parents, it is God's desire that your children would become radical kingdom Christians. So if you pray that over them, he will hear it. I want to share a story of my late grandmother, Joan Divini. And even before I was even conceived, years before, Joan Divini was praying for me every single day. And then my entire life, until she passed away, she would pray for me every single day. And I'm here to tell you today that I'm not walking in my calling, purpose, and destiny because I made the right decisions. Because I made lots of wrong decisions. I'm walking in my calling, purpose, and destiny because she prayed it over me. She covered my life in prayer. She saturated every part of my life in destiny, in future, in prayer. I'm now living in the promises and fulfillment that have come from the decades of her simple, obedient, faithful prayers. Church, God is looking for the next generation of Joan Divinis, the people that are going to simply just cover their families in prayer. Parents, you have spiritual authority in your household that no pastor can replace. You are the only one that can make your home an environment of supernatural expectation and hunger for God to move in your children's lives. Only you can make your home an altar of intercession before the Lord every day. I know I'm getting all up in your business right now, but it's because the future depends on your prayers. 
Look, there are heavenly destiny, plans, purpose, and calling that are waiting to be released. And they're waiting for you to pray so that they would come about. God is sovereign and he does whatever he wants. But parents, what if I told you that when God predestined your life, he planned that you would pray like crazy for your children? And students, kids, pray for your parents to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They need your prayer covering too. And if you don't have any kids, just pray for any younger person you know to be filled with the fire of God. They need it, I promise. Church, my prayer today is that God would refill your faith tank to believe again for the impossible, to believe that the miraculous could become the norm, the standard in your household. Families, I know that raising children in 2021 is a challenge. It is hard, but know that God sees you and he's with you in it. And what your kids need more than anything is your daily, simple, obedient prayers. Church, I'm going to go hang out with my wife now. I love you. You're amazing. The next generation is waiting for our prayers. His mom and I, we've just prayed that he'd be more passionate. He lacks passion. And so... (laughs) It's like living with the Holy Spirit. I'm glad he's out of the house, quite frankly. Less conviction. (laughs) Well, here's some homework. Here's some homework. And uh, let me just start with this, though. I I sense this in this room, because this is what our flesh and the enemy loves to do, right? Um, I sense that some of you are going, um, I haven't done this. I'm a failure. And the enemy's saying, that's right. You are a failure, but I want to remind all of us that we don't serve a God of yesterday. We serve a God of the right now. And God is saying right now, graciously, lovingly, like any good father, start right now. Start right now. So let me give you one piece of homework, just one. It's what Noah said. It's what Charity said. Pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray every day for your your children and your grandchildren and your nephews and nieces and your friends' children. Sometimes people will say, and I I get it, they'll say, I'm not sure what to pray. So I wanna wanna give you some things to pray. Um, I wrote out 24, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but they're in in the Bible app. I'll, if you write me or call me or text me, I'll send these things to you. It's just a word and a scripture next to it. So pray for things like belief and, and that they would be content, that they would be faithful. Pray for things like fruit, spiritual fruit, to walk by the power of the Holy Spirit and live out the, the fruit of the Spirit, for them to be generous, um, to have integrity, to be full of joy and kindness and love. Pray for obedience. Pray that they would be patient and that they would experience the peace of God. As Brad mentioned, here are some other resources we think will be really, really helpful for you. Let me just tell you, for for Ruth and I, through different stages of um, our marriage and our, our child raising, right next to the side of our bed, both sides, her side and my side, when I was first married, I had this many books on how to be a good husband. I I was raised in an unbelieving family. I didn't have any role models, not that I saw, not that I knew. And so I was begging, borrowing, and steal from anyone in the church, anything I could read, anyone I could talk to. Then as our our boys were born and and God gave us the privilege of raising them up, again, I was raised in in a house full of divorce and pain and shame. I didn't know how to be a dad. So I asked, I read, I prayed. Um... Our God is the God of right now. Don't don't let the wicked one, don't let your flesh tell you lies. God wants to do something significant in this thing called the oikos, 
the family of God, and he wants you to be a part of it. So some resources, as Brad mentioned earlier, incredible book, Family Discipleship, by Matt Chandler and Adam Griffin. In the, in the months to come, Ruth and I are going to do a small group for, for parents with young kids with this book. We think it's amazing. Family Worship by Donald Whitney, great, great tool. We also, they, we printed off some prayer cards for you. They're free. The books cost, but the prayer cards are free. And it's seven ways, practical ways, you can pray for your children. So, hey, do me a favor, let's stand together. And if you're on the prayer team, why don't you start making your way up even now? In just a few minutes, we're gonna have our, our time of communion and our ministry time. If you're on the prayer team, come on up now. And, and maybe you need to do what I did many times, and at times I still do it, is go up and say, pray for me as a dad. Pray for me as a mom, as a grandparent. Let's worship.